Good. Good morning. Yay. Okay. So today's reading is going to be from 2 Kings 7, 1 through 9. If you have the Black Bibles in front of you, it's on page 300. Should I just start yelling? <laughs> Got it. Elisha replied, hear the word of the Lord. And this is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow at Samaria's gate, six quarts of fine flour will sell for half ounce of silver. And 12 quarts of barley will sell for a half ounce of silver. Then the captain, the king's right-hand man, responded to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord were to make windows in heaven, could this really happen? Elisha announced, You will, in fact, see it with your own eyes, but you won't eat any of it. Now four men with a skin disease were at the entrance to the city gate. They said to each other, Why just sit here until we die? If we say, let's go into the city, we will die there because of the famine is in the city. But if we sit here, we will also die. So now, come on, let's surrender to the Arameans' camp. If they let us live, we will live, and if they kill us, we will die. So as the diseased men got up at twilight to come to the Arameans' camp, what they came to the camp's edge, they discovered that no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean camp to hear the sound of chariots, horses in a large army. The Arameans had said to each other, the king of Israel must have hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to attack us. So they had gotten up and fled at twilight, abandoning their tents, horses, and donkeys. The camp was intact and they had fled for their lives. When the diseased men came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent to eat and drink. They picked up silver, gold, and clothing and went off and hid them. They came back and entered another tent, picked these things up, and hid them. Then they said to each other, We're not doing what is right. Today is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until morning light, our punishment will catch up with us. So let's go tell the king's household. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go before the Lord. Father, Father, we're thankful that we get the, a chance to sit under your word. Father, that allow this to be a reminder that you are alive and that you are active, that you are moving amongst your people. So, Father, allow us to sit at your feet this morning. Allow us to interact, Father, with how you have interacted with your people throughout history, recognizing that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can trust, we can have confidence in your character, in, your, in who you are. And so, Father, although the seasons may change, Father, you are truly our rock and our redeemer. You are our constant. And so, Father, it's in you that we put, we place our anchor, we place our confidence, we put our trust in you and in you alone. And so, Father, we just pray ultimately that you would use us as conduits of your grace for thy will to be done. It would help us in this time. And Father, we're thankful, Lord, that even the prayers that we pray today we know that, are, that they are heard. Not because of how well we performed this past week, not because of how sincere we may have even sung, but Father, because of the person and work of your son Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. And so Father, we can boldly enter into your throne room of grace and your mercy towards us. And so Father, we say thank you. So allow, allow us, Lord, to put off any desire to have to perform, any desire to have to do anything that doesn't align with you, but help us to align our hearts to thy will on earth as it is in heaven. So Father, give us today the bread, the substance 
the word that we need so that we can act and move and surrender accordingly. Yes. And it's to you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory is given. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. All right, welcome. What's up, you guys? How you doing? Good. I am so glad to be here. My name is Dehai Lewis. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm excited. I feel like I have to reintroduce myself because I've been gone for a couple of weeks. I've been all across the world, literally. I was got a chance to go to Japan for the first time with some of my kids and got a chance to even go to a few different places. But it was uh, definitely a time of rest and replenishment and restoration, ultimately what I constantly ask the Lord every kind of summer during the time that we are able to, to do that. So I'm grateful um, and, and thankful for you all. I'm also just excited. I mean, if you guys have been here for any amount of time if, or for any amount of years, you know that this is always my favorite time of the year, right? This is like actually not the first day, but next week we start our DNA Sundays. And DNA Sundays is always, by far, it's easily the best time of the year for, for me is the most excited time that I get because it's a time that we get a chance to kind of reconfirm who we are as a church, how God has fearfully and wonderfully made us. And so I'm really excited. But the other reason why I think I'm excited about this time and this season, because this is a time that is a, is a shift in season. I don't know who did it, but somebody in the bookmakers decided that August was a good place to return back to school. I don't know. I mean, I grew up like post Labor Day easily, like going back to school. But somehow now we're going back to school August the 1st. And so this August the 1st, we are going back to school. Right. And we're going to be having our kids. And so it's a time where we get a chance to do as a staff and as a church. We do a thing called day one. And there's all these different types of things that we do. Just as, But it's a it's a mark of a new season. It's a mark of recalibration. It's a mark for us to realign ourselves, to be reminded that Christianity is not a religion, but it's about our relationship. Relationship. It's our relationship with God, our relationship with other believers, our relationship with our neighbors, and ultimately our relationship with our time, talent, and treasure. And so it's a time that we get a chance to re-up. And so I get excited about these times. I love kind of where Pastor Carly taught us last week and as a bridge to kind of where we go, because I think it's, it's a perfect bridge of how the book of James kind of led us to the part of just simply what does mutual confession, what does mutual repentance to one another look like? And just even last week, a time of us just being able to confess our faults one to another so that we can pray one for another, that it gives us the ability to really kind of like strip away all the excess, all the things, and just get back to the core of what it is. We remember Remember when Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That at the core of everything we do, it comes back to this concept of repentance and what that looks like. And so when I talk about repentance, it's not just simply repenting from the bad things that we do. But when I think about repentance, it's a time for us to, one, talk about to, to confess, just to simply tell the truth about where we are, that this is a time where we get a chance to process kind of where we have, where I've been with the Lord, where I'm going, what my desires are with the Lord, a time of restoration, a time of replenishment, right? It's just a time to just kind of recalibrate. But not only is repentance about confession, repentance is all also, um, it's also about the, the idea of being able, oh man, I lost the confession. Let me just go to my notes because I totally... <laughs> Lost it. Yes. So repentance is about confession, but it is also about telling the truth of where we are, but it's also about changing, changing the way we see both ourselves and see God. You see, because when we talk about repentance, the, if we, the first thing, if we tell the truth about where we are and who we are, then we will begin to see ourselves differently and then thus see God differently. Right, Because we will come and recognize that we are coming from a different vantage point, that the, the word repent is from the Greek word metanoia, which simply means to change. That ultimately, that this is a time in this season, it's a period that we can change the way we see God and also change the way we see one another. But ultimately, the last thing repentance is, is clinging. That it's the opportunity to stop trusting in ourselves and to cling on to Jesus that we have that opportunity. And this is an invitation for us to be able to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see, I think this is really important for us in every season of life, but I also think this is important for us when we begin new seasons. 
that oftentimes when we think about seasons, we recognize that different seasons bring about different responsibilities or different things or different characteristics that we have. We all know that whatever season you like, I don't know if summer, spring, fall, or winter is your favorite season, but we all know that there are certain things that you ought not do in certain seasons. Like if it's 110 degrees outside, no one is trying to wear a hoodie right? But some people are, and you look at them like, what's going on with you, right? Because you said, this is not the appropriate attire for this season. Or if it's 40 degrees outside, even though some people in the congregation do it, they're not supposed to wear shorts, right? And see, because there's, there's an appropriateness to, right, seasons that we have, that we bring different things, different realities, and different seasons that we, we would perform differently. And so it's no... It's no different for us in our season, right? This season that when as school comes back, this is the time where we know that our kids are going back to school. It's the time that we're going back to school. We're getting back ready. We're gearing back up. Angie and I were just, even over the last couple of days, have just spent time of just really processing, praying. I was just like, all right, where have we been? Where are we now? Where is God keeping us? Well, our kids have talked us into doing a thing called 75 Heart. I don't know if you've heard that so I'm doing I'm in the midst of 75 heart which basically is five things go read it I'm not going to give you because that's not a part of the message but it's that like this what does it look like because part of it is I like to have a shift to recognize and to kind of buffet my body to remind myself that we are in a different season that we're entering into a different season and that there's new things that I have to to do because the Bible tells us to be ready to preach God's word to be ready whether we're in the season that we prefer or we're in the season that we don't like. We ought to be ready. You see, and what I also like about season is that seasons, no matter if you're ready for them or not, they are going to come and they are going to go. And for some of us, we would love for it to be spring all year round, but that's just not what's going to happen. Some of us would love for it to be summer and hot. Some of us would love to be winter. But with all, whatever season, God has a way that every three months, no matter what season that we're in, guess what? Salvation or change or what is coming. And we got a chance to just be, to find God's faithfulness in whatever season that we're in. You see, because one of the things that we can get easily confused is that we can begin as Christians to, put, to begin to put our confidence in prayer or put our confidence in worship service, or put our confidence in gatherings, or whatever it may be. You see, we are not the only people to pray. We're not the only people to gather. We're not the only people to sing worship. But our confidence comes not in our prayer, but our confidence comes in who we are praying to. Our confidence comes with who we are worshiping to, who we are gathering for. Our confidence is in Christ, not in our ability to perform or to act in season. So this period, this time reminds us no, no matter whatever season, he is with us. And that we remind ourselves. And that's where we are today. So as I started thinking about the message, that we had this message that we ended the book of James and we're going into this DNA series. What is a, what is a passage, what is a bridge passage that can help us to bridge, I believe, this, this season of this ministry and of our time? So... We find ourselves in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 7, and we're going to be going through verse 1 through 20, and thank you for reading the text. 2 Kings chapter 7, 1 through 20. You see, one of the things that we don't like is that we don't like the fear of the unknown, and so some of us, we don't like going into new seasons because we don't like change. And as soon as we kind of got this figured out, we was like, all right, we're about to go into another season. It's like, I just got this season together, right? But also, when we, when we see this changing of seasons, that there's this time of vulnerability that we have to endure. And today's passage talks about a very vulnerable time in the life of Israel. And I want to give some insight some insight to how those who actually lived through some of the worst of days, some of the worst of times, and how they were able to recapture their hope in their season. 
You see, if you're familiar with the text, 2 Kings chapter 7 is coming off where we're coming off, but off of chapter 6, which chapter 6 is a very interesting passage. Right there, we are talking to the Syrians, and the Syrians in chapter 6 are in, in the middle of a war with Israel. And so what they've done is, or with Samaria, and what they've done is that they've come around this, the place of Samaria, and they began to engulf or encamped around it, so much so that there was no food going in or out of Israel. And so because of it, a, a starvation, a famine came about during that time. And so that it was so long and for, so, um, for such a, a period in this season, what ended up happening is that it got so desperate that the king even heard that cannibalization began to happen. Right? The, literally, in 2 Kings chapter 6, you would read that um, the king is approached by someone that one of the, uh, one of the women uh, in, um, in his city basically came and says, King, King, can you help me? Because, my, because it has become so hard that I, a woman approached me and she said, you, you know, kill your kid and we'll eat your kid today and tomorrow we'll kill our, my kid and eat my kid today. Yes, this is in the Bible, right? And so in this time, what we see is that there is cannibalization. It has become so hard. And so just like any man or any person, the king is grieved. He is vexed. He is hurt that it has come down to this where people are eating their own children. So think about how hard it has to be for you, us to succumb to eating your own children, right? So times are hard, things are that bad, that in this place in Israel. But here's what happens is that the king who comes in, he comes in and he says, listen, I am so mad, I'm so, he begins to blame not the enemies outside the camp, he begins to blame God. And as he begins to blame God, he also begins to blame, right, God's man, Elisha, the prophet the one that was saying, thus saith the Lord. And so this king immediately in his rage and knowing how to take it out, knowing how to take it out, he sends one of his, his messengers, not one of his messengers, he sends his army to find out where he is. Where is Elijah? He finds out where he is and then he goes and basically sends his whole army and then basically with the idea that we're about to kill Elijah, God's man because he is the symbol, he is the representation of God who's behind all of this. And so what we see in verse 6 and 33, we see this king, right, ending off with ultimately blaming the Lord and his prophet for the state in which they're in. To me, it sounds a, a lot familiar to where we are as a country in so many ways. We see this man we see what is taking place. So at the end, what we go into chapter seven, God kind of brings out kind of four primary peoples. He talks about Elijah, the prophet. We're going to see him. We're going to see the king who's vexed and has mad about the current circumstances that his city is in that has been aimed at God and at his prophet. We're going to see the king's captain, his right-hand man. And we're going to talk about how his right-hand man handled this. And then we're going to see four lepers. Four lepers. And at first glance, you look, it's just like, well, where, how do they fit into the story? But we're going to see how God uses the unlikely to bring about supernatural. Right? And ultimately, what we're saying is that whenever we go through suffering, whenever we go through suffering, suffering has a way to either suffocate our faith or to accelerate it. It has a way of doing that that we recognize in a post beyond, in our beyond everything world. We're post COVID, post this, post, post the uh, things and going into a new season that there's triggers and there's trauma and there's things that's going on. Even the past um, um, couple of weeks, we saw the president resign, right? Or not resign, not go for another election. You see, so we see this taking place. And so what we see is that we start off with what are the people of God to do in the midst of this time? In 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1, it starts off with Elijah. 
Elijah. And we have to kind of stop there because the word Elijah is a representative of the prophet of God. That we have to go all the way back to the Exodus and to Exodus and with the call of the prophets. The prophets weren't just there just to talk about, let me tell you the future, let me read your palm, let me give you kind of insight on what's going to take place. But the prophets were there primarily to call people back to covenant faithfulness. And so he starts off in chapter 7, in the midst of all of this turmoil, in the midst of all these things, that he starts with Elijah, the man of God, the prophet of God, who is there, and people know that his primary role is to call people back to covenant faithfulness with God. That he begins there, and he says, Elijah replied. This is his response to the threats, to the accusations, to the things. He doesn't begin to leave the word of God, but he goes in back into God's word. He doesn't come up with another shifty way of saying the same thing, but basically what God was saying, no. He goes back to the one who is able to deliver us from this. And so he says, Elijah replied, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says about this time tomorrow at Samaria's gate, six quarts of fine flour will sell for a half ounce of silver and 12 quarts of barley will sell for a half ounce of silver. He's like, all right, what does that have to do with what's going on? See, what's going on right now? Again, there's a famine in the land. And basically, the, word, the man of God says, and he says something that is supernatural, that really sounds illogical, and ultimately, for most people, impossible. And he says, guess what? We are going to have, um, coming up, we're going to have a yard sale, or we're going to have a farmer's market. And this farmer's market, the, the, it, the produce, the, the stuff is going to be cheaper than you ever saw it before. So hear about this. We're in a time where people are eating their kids. It is that bad. It is that gruesome in the, in the land right now that he's saying, hey, tomorrow, by tomorrow, God is going to do something that not only is he going to bring the produce and the meat and all the things, he is going to sell it at a discounted rate. Right? He's going to sell it at this kind of rate. And so think about this. Think about the thing that you've been in begging God for for so long, that you've been asking God to heal or asking God to do. And then all of a sudden, a person comes to you and says, guess what? By tomorrow, not only is God going to meet it, he's going to do it in such a way that it's going to be easy for you to obtain. Just like that. Would, would you be like, oh, I trust God. I believe God. I'm just going to walk into that. Is that. Would that be your response? No. You see, and that's not the response of the people who are responsible, especially if you're responsible for thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. You have the king and you have the king's captain. He hears this word and he responds inappropriately. In verse 2, it says, Then the captain, the king's right-hand man, responded to the man of God. He says, Look, even if the Lord were to make windows in heaven, could this really happen? You know, some of us are not that bold to say that in public, but we all wrestle with that in our hearts. That, Lord, I understand that you have given us a word, but are you really able to make it happen? Are you really able? I guarantee you this wasn't the first prayer that was mentioned. If, if you got family, we know that in times of famine, in times of hunger, in times of serious trauma, even non-believers are praying. So it's not like, the, like the, we had a country that has never prayed or has never done anything. They're, have, they're producing anything. So this is not like the first prayer, but now all of a sudden, it's all going to be fixed by tomorrow. You see, but what this captain represents is the current state of unbelief in the land. He represents where Elijah represents the word of the Lord. The captain represents unbelief. He represents both the king and the king's captain who's cynical, who's unbelieving, it ultimately, the, of the state of the city, he represents what many in Israel, many of Samaria must have felt. And this is ultimately, the, the, I believe, the resounding kind of state of our country right now. And this is why we see the lack of faith, the lack of trust in God and his word, the lack of trust in the church. So Elijah comes back and 
the second half of that verse, and he says, you will in fact see with your own eyes, but you won't eat any of it. This is his response to the captain. And so all of a sudden, we have this going on. And see, here's what we got to recognize, that this was going on in kind of in the king's courts, and this is going on where the, where the, in the room where it happens, right? So this is happening, and all of a city are still in survival mode, that God has already put into work a plan to bring about salvation. We don't know how, we don't know when, we don't, or we know when, but we don't know how or even how it's going to, to come about. But so now he then, the, the, it's like if we we're in a movie, it immediately goes from this kind of tight circle, this room, and it immediately pans out, and now we are at the city gate. So what's going on at the city gate? We are introduced to a new group of people. In verse 3 it says, Now, four men with a skin disease were at the entrance to the city gate right? Some of your Bibles say four lepers. These are ultimately the people that have been ostracized. They have, they have a certain ailment and their um, and, and skin disease and all that, that they were considered ceremonially impure. So that's the reason why you find them at the city gate. They have been pushed to the margins. They have been pushed to the outside. They were not even able to suffer amongst their city, amongst their people. So not only were they experiencing the same pain as everyone else feels, but they was also experienced ostracism. There was also experienced loneliness, isolation. And so the, it, it zooms in to this place where you see these four men. But these four men begin to interact with one another. And these four men, these four lepers, were at the entrance of the city gate. And they said to each other, why just sit here until we die? If we say, let's go into the city, we die there because the famine is in the city. But if we sit here, we also die. So now, come on, let's surrender to the Arameans' camp. And if they let us live, we will live. And if they kill us, then we will die. You like their options right there? Each one of them talked about death. That's the state of where they are, that no matter what state that we're in, we are going to potentially die, right? And so these four lepers basically are faced with three choices. They can, one, they can sit back and continue to suffer, or I'm sorry, slip back and, and simply suffer with everyone else. And I think in one way, there was just like, we can, if we go back into the city, we can fall back into our old patterns, we can fall back to our old ways and try to figure this out because everybody else is probably figuring out and kind of go back into my own habits of how I've survived in this world. I can go back to that. But ultimately, I know because I've been there, we've seen it, we know that's ultimately going to lead to death. But it's a logical decision, because even if we're going to suffer, at least I don't have to suffer alone. I can suffer with my friends, the ones that I've left before I had this disease, the ones that, I, that we ultimately do. So he's possibly seeking kind of like, what are some man-made alternatives, slipping back? The other option that they say is that, no, all right, we can just kind of sit here and starve, right? Which ultimately... It's kind of like, or, or we can just kind of sit and we can just continue to talk amongst one another as lepers. And we can continually just sit here and just kind of like be resolved to it is what it is. This is where God has us. That if we die, we die. We, just, we will have to suffer. This option is more of the idea of this kind of the, 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 the idea of just reserving just to kind of just accept the things as they are. But then the last one he says in verse 4, the, the last part of verse 4, he says we can, we can surrender and we can seek mercy. But what's interesting about this is that when he talks about surrendering and seeking mercy, he's not talking about, they're not talking about primarily surrendering and seeking mercy from God. They're talking about surrendering and seeking mercy from their enemy. So there's this like, what does it look like for us to go into the land and basically beg our enemies, the people who have put us in this situation, and ask for mercy? You see, I really believe that this passage is brought in these four lepers that are presented, I think in some ways is a picture of us as the church. Us as believers, us 
as Christians, those who have been marginalized, those who have been put on the side in so many ways, those who believe we are the primary, for good reason and bad reasons, that we are the primary reasons of why we are in the state, the current state that we are in. And for many of us, we are been put into the marginalized. But also what we see and what we're going to see in this is that these are people that are, are recipients, are going to be recipients of the undeserving grace of God. These who are all lepers, who are all ostracized at the city gate, have, have, have an understanding and they have embraced their brokenness. Right? And so what they ultimately are saying with their three options, if they slip back, they will simply go into survival mode. If they sit there, then we can just sit there and just kind of have our holy huddles amongst the saints and complain about all the things that's going on in all these worlds. Or we can surrender and ultimately seek the Lord's will, seek mercy. So these four lepers represent what we are going to see of God's source of blessing. It's his thing, coming from the most unlikely of places in the time. And so what we see is this, these parts that are coming. And so in verse 5 it says, So the diseased men got up at the twilight to go to the Arameans' camp. When they came to the camp's edge, they discovered that no one was there. The Lord has caused the Aramean camp to hear the sound of the chariots, horses, and, the, and a large army. The Arameans had said to each other, the king of Israel must have hired kings of the Hittites and the kings of, the Egypt, of Egypt to attack us. So they had gotten up and fled at twilight, abandoning their tents, horses, and donkeys. The camp was intact and they had fled for their lives. When these diseased men or these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into the tent to eat and drink. They, then they picked up the silver, the gold, and, the, and clothing and went, in, went off and hid them. Then came back and entered another tent, picked things up and hid them. Then they said to each other, we are not doing what is right. Today is a day of good news. And if we are silent until, and wait until morning light, our punishment will catch up with us. So let's go tell the king's household. What I love about this passage is the honesty of the passage. What I love about this passage is that you have these four lepers who goes in, not ultimately trusting God per se, but trusting, will you please forgive me? I'm, I'm you know, in my enemies because I have nowhere else to go. Not knowing exactly, but you got to understand that even in that, that God had a different plan. That their surrender was actually a way that he was going to use their step out on faith. In their seeking mercy, that they were going to be able to see God's redemption or God's salvation. You see, as these people who have been on the outside of the land, as they begin to go into the edge of the camp, what we see is that these people seeing, there's this like, they was expecting certain things and they didn't hear what they thought. They saw the horses and tacks. And so as they go in, they begin to do what all of us do. Let's first take care of ourselves. Let's feed ourselves. And not only let's do that, let's do it multiple times. And what I love about the passage, again, is the honesty of it. And it says they, they got some food. They was like, all right, people go find out about this. Let's go hide some just for later. They go hide some stuff. They was just like, I'm still a little hungry. You a little hungry? Yeah, let's go back and they go get some more stuff. And they do this multiple times. But it was at that time that something quickened them, something reminded them, like the say it's the Spirit, basically saying, hey, one of them said, what we are doing is wrong because this is the gospel. You know what the gospel means is simply good news. We have stumbled upon good news. That in a time of frustration, in a time of death, in a time where people are eating one another, in a time where people are going, that we have stepped into something. That we have the cure, we have the solution to the problems that they have. So we have a couple of options. Either we can continue to feed ourselves and make sure we're good, because how do we know they're not coming back? Or we can go and tell the people back home, back in the city, you know, the ones who've isolated us, the ones who hate us, the ones who ostracized us, 
the ones who put us out on the city gate, the ones that wouldn't allow, allow us in. We have all, every reason why not to go back. And you know what I love about the story and as we continue to read, when they go back, it wasn't like they were able to go back into the inner city or the inner part of the city. They had to tell the guards at the gate. And then the guards at the gate had to go tell the people. So they were still never accepted in there, but they had the good news. So we see this right here that after they find out this good news and they said that we must not hoard this news solely for ourselves, but we must take it. It says these is diseased, um, I'm sorry, when the diseased men came down lower, if we are silent and wait until morning, our punishment will catch up with us. So let's tell the king's household. Verse 10, the diseased men are these lepers came and called to the city's gatekeepers and told them. So where did they go back? They couldn't go back to the place where all the people were. He had to, they had to go back to still the place where they are, the outer edges. They still weren't accepted, even though they were about to bring salvation to the whole city. They had to go to the city gates. So these diseased men went to the city gates, right? And he went out, um, the these men came to the city gates and told them, we went to the Aramean camp and no one was there. No human sounds. There was nothing but tethered horses and donkeys and tents and they were all intact. The gatekeepers called out and the news was reported to the king's house. So the gatekeepers took it to the king's house. In verse 12, so the king got up at, in the night and said to his servants, let me tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know that we are starving, so they have left the camp to hide in the open country, thinking when they come out of the city, we will take them alive and go into the city. So not only, they, I love it, honestly, the, the king responded the same way we responded. This is too good to be true. This is the trap. I ain't buying. Right? And so the king right here is coined. And so there's salvation. Remember, there's, there's already sit. It's already there. But it goes to the city gate. The city gates goes to the household. The household goes to the king. The king says, this is a trap. I don't believe it. I don't trust it at all. I don't trust it at all. And what does he say? He talks to his servants, and then his servants respond. But one of his servants responded, please let the messengers take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their fate is like the entire Israelite community who will die. So let's send them and see. Verse 14, then the messengers took two chariots with horses, and the king sent them after the Aramean army, saying, go and see. So they followed them as far as the Jordan. They saw that the whole way, they saw the whole way was littered with clothes and equipment, and Arameans had thrown off into their haste. The messengers returned and told the king. How long did you think that take? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly. But what I love about it is that there was good news that was delivered, but it, the people did not experience for a long extended period because the king had to go things. And there's some things that we are maybe laboring amongst people. We have been praying for things to happen, but God has already brought salvation, but there's still a process that they have to go to to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord. And what we have is that we have these lepers who are experiencing the joy of their salvation still having to wait even though they've done their responsibility for God or for them to accept, for them to receive all that God has. And so once the king was finally satisfied, verse 16, that says, then the people went out and plundered the Aramean camp, and it was then that six quarts of fine flour sold for a half ounce of silver, 12 quarts of barley sold for a half ounce of silver, According to the word of the Lord, the king had appointed the, um, the captain, his right-hand man, to be in charge of the city gate, but the people trampled him in the gate. He died just as the man of God had predicted. And when the king had come to him, when the man of God had said to the king, 
About this time tomorrow, 12 quarts of barley will sell for a half ounce of silver. Six quarts of fine flour will sell for a half ounce of silver at the Samaria's gate. The captain had answered the man of God. Look, even if the Lord were to make windows in heaven, could this really happen? Elijah said, you will in fact see with your own eyes, but you won't eat any of it. This is what happened to him. The people trampled him at the city gate. So we recognize, we know that God did this all in 24 hours, even though a lot has taken place in that time. But what we see is a group of people who in many ways have given up hope, found in this next season of life, being seeing their hope restored. These lepers that are the most unlikely in all of the story to bring about or to be used for God to bring about salvation are the people that have. These lepers who never were named, these lepers who are only defined as that, lepers, those that have been ostracized, these people that we never know have ever, would ever be received into the city, that they were the people that God used to bring about salvation. You see, and this, is my, this is my prayer. This is our prayer. As we enter into this season, and as we believe that we have stumbled over or stumbled on good news, no matter how God has brought us to this point, that we would not plunder it for ourselves, but we would share how God has brought about deliverance in a time of such turmoil, how God can provide peace in the midst of chaos, that in the midst of where there's the, the shifting sands of this world, that he is our refuge. He is the one who strengthens us. He is the one who sustains us. That he is the one that, give, that um, allows us to um, allow our suffering to seed our hope in Christ and not allow it to be suffocated. Not allow it to be suffocated. So my question to us as we move into this new season and my invitation to us all is, Will we hope again? Will we hope again? You see, I understand that over these last few years, over these last few, I don't know how long, I know your story or some of the stories in here, and I know the pain and the trauma and the hurt that some people have gone through and the testimony that so many have. And for some of us, we're kind of like treating God this way. Come closer, but stay away. Come closer, but stay away. Are we really willing and are able to trust God for real? Are we really willing and able to truly hope again? But are, have we allowed our faith to have, be the type of faith that we would have is that we trust you, God, as long as I can contain, maintain a little bit of control over the circumstances? You see, God has to, has to sometimes put us in impossible situations so that we can stop depending on ourselves and stop depending on our keenness or our cunning abilities. And we can simply trust in the one that is able to deliver us. And no matter where we are in the city place, wherever we find ourselves positioned, that God is a God that is able to redeem and that God is a God that, is, that has already laid our hope for us in heaven. Now, we're not talking about a hope that is a 50-50 chance that it's going to rain today, but we're talking about a hope that is that God has already redeemed and he's already purchased it. That all we have to do is walk into the salvation, walk into what God has for us. But we have to trust and we have to believe that it's not a trap. It's not a bait and switch. But we have to simply trust. And so I'm just going to end, I'm going to give you four things really quickly to practice of how can we rebuild our trust? How can we in this season, as we enter into this new season, how can we do it? Number one, what I see is that we have to start with confession. The number one thing that we have to do is that we have to tell the truth of where we are. Tell the truth. Wherever we are with the Lord, wherever we are with our trust, wherever we are, we have to simply tell the truth. I love the ultimate things. And when you look at the, per, the these verses, I think it's four or five times, it says, if we say, if we say, if we say. Basically, they're, they're playing their options. They're playing their options. What options do I have? Where, I'm, where am I 
at with God if we say. So we have to start with confession. Number two, we have to cultivate confidence. Why do we have to cultivate confidence? Because with his presence, he is with us. He has never lived us. He has never forsought us. That he was still speaking, even in the most desperate times in that country. He was still speaking to the man of the Lord. He is still speaking today. He is speaking. We just have to sit and we have to listen and surrender to God's word. He has something to say, no matter where we are. And we have to remind ourselves of his presence. That's the reason why give us this day our daily bread. It's not to kind of remind God, it's to remind us that you are here, you are our substance. And so I go to him each and every day to remind me that I need him, that he is my daily bread, that I'm not. So we have to cultivate the confidence. Third, we have to walk with courage. I love the honesty. The people had fear. The three options and all three options that they had, if we do this, we'll die. If we do that, we'll die. If we do this, we may not die, but we're probably gonna die. Over and over and over again, all the options are like they died, but guess what? They were still able to move. Right? And so I think it's important for us to still trust. It's not that we're not going to have fear, but the Bible says that God did not give us the spirit of phobos, of phobia, that we allow our fear to control us, that keeps us from doing anything. But even though we may have fear that we walk, and we recognize that the beginning of wisdom is actually a, a, is, it's where we properly place our fear, as a fear of the Lord. I may be afraid, but I have someone that I'm, I reverence even more than even my own fear. And I put my confidence in him and in him alone. So we have to walk with courage. And finally, we have to continue with compassion. The end of the book that these four lepers came to the conclusion, we have discovered good news. We got to go share with the people that don't like us, the people that have ostracized us, and the people that make us stay on the city's edge. But it's still good news, not only for us, but it's good news for them. You see, what compassion is, compassion is an understanding, is when we understand that a love for others crowds out our love for ourselves alone. Too many of us are just focusing in on justification, being justified, why we are not crossing the lines or going to the other side or doing the other things or people who have offended us or whatever. But no, we have these lepers who had all the reasons in the world not to bring about the good news that they've experienced. But they said, no, go back, go back. We gotta continue to cultivate compassion for even those that are trying to destroy us. Because this is what the word of the Lord has said. And this is how we are able to restore the joy, the hope, the passion of the good news that we have. Don't let a hard life jade you to let you just simply resolve, just to exist. Constantly cultivate a heart to pursue God above all else. Keep your heart tender before him because that's the hardest thing to do out of all these things is that that, that I'm gonna keep my heart soft even though I keep getting misused. It keeps being abused. That That God has still called me. Even though I've been treated like a leper, God has called me to bring the salvation, this good news, to the city. So I pray that as we kick off August, as we kick off the DNA series, I pray that we would restore our hope in him. We would restore our joy, our confidence in him. And that's really my prayer for us as we go into this season that God is. And guess what? If this season is going to be hard, guess what? In another three months, the seasons will change. Because we are a God, we serve a God that operates in seasons. We just got to hold on to him in the midst. Father, we're thankful for the grace that you've given us, Lord.